Morning, everybody. I think it's time to get going. And um, if you would like, open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32. That's where we'll pick up in verse 21 this evening. Um, we're looking at the period where we're kind of all collectively holding our breath for Israel because we don't know what's going to happen yet. God makes this covenant with them in chapter 24. And things are going really well. Moses goes up onto the mountain to receive instruction about the building of the tabernacle and also to receive the two tablets of stone. And while he's up on the mountain, how long is he up there for? 40 days. And, a half. and what happens while he's up there? Yeah, they create this idol and uh, they... they cry out and they say, you know, make us gods to Aaron. Aaron makes a god, a, a golden calf, and says, this is the god that led you out of the land of Egypt. The people worship it, and uh, they rose up to play. And I don't know what all's involved in that rising up to play. We're going to see in today's lesson that the people were unrestrained, and uh, we may talk a little bit about what the possibilities are there. Is God oblivious to this? Not at all. Now, Moses is. Moses is up there. God's speaking to him. And then God says, whoop, stop everything. They've sinned. I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to make of you a great nation and fulfill these promises through you. And what does Moses do? He intercedes and he, he pleads with the Lord, therefore, not to destroy this, this people and turn from your fierce wrath and, and relent from the harm of this people. And what does God do? He does. He relents. And so he's not going to destroy the people as he first told Moses that he was going to do. And so Moses comes down from the mountain and comes down and he sees the people and uh, they're dancing and partying. And he takes these two tablets of stone and he smashes them, indicating this is what you have done to the covenant that you made with God. And then he took the golden calf and he burnt whatever could be burnt and he took the rest of it and ground it into powder, mixed it with water and caused them to drink it. In other words, signifying the idea, you will bear the consequences for this action. And so uh, that brings us to verse 21. And so now who made the golden calf? Aaron did. All right. So now God or Moses turns to Aaron in verse 21 and he says, What did this people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? In other words, what you have done is you just nearly wiped out all of this people by this action. What did they do that would cause you to do something like that? And here's Aaron's response. So Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people, that they are set on evil. What do you think? Is he, is he speaking truth so far? Yeah, I would say so. People are bent on evil. They're the ones who said, make us gods, right? For they said to me, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, I, we do not know what has become of him. Still on track here with the truth. And I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them break it off. Still on track with the truth. This is an accurate record of what took place up to this point. And then he said, so they gave it to me, and I cast it into the fire, and this calf came out. Now, I don't know. I, I think I do know, but maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe what he's doing is he's wording this in such a way just to give the very, very most basic information about that they did give this to him. He did put it in the fire to melt it down. And the end result was a golden calf. Maybe that's what he means. But what it sounds like he's saying is, I really didn't have much to do with this. I just took it and threw it into the fire, and I don't know how it happened, but a golden calf came out. And if that is what's being indicated here, I love Moses' response. Because what is Moses' response? He doesn't have one. Have you ever had that conversation with someone when they say something that is just so ridiculous that you just kind of blink a few times and go, okay, well, we'll move on. <laughs> and, and that seems to be what's happening here on this occasion. 
Aaron definitely does not seem to, to, to fess up to his responsibility. And that's what, that's what Moses initially speaks to him about. What did these people do that you brought this great sin upon them? And uh, Aaron doesn't, I think I said Moses, but Aaron doesn't uh, fess up to this and own up to this. Now, I may not understand everything that's going on there, but just in my natural reading of it, that, that seems to be the, kind of the way this conversation goes down. You have anything you want to say about that? It's a silly, silly excuse. And he, he's not taking any of the blame uh, for his part of it. Yeah. It doesn't seem like he's willing to. He, he would rather come up with this excuse than to say, yeah, I messed up. I don't, I don't have much more than that. Anybody else have anything you want to add? I, I do think that that's what's driving this is that that seems to be the the uh, catalyst that gets this started is we don't know what happened to Moses and, and I, I like what you said they've always had somebody to tell them what to do Moses has been telling them what to do now we don't know what to, we need something here and, and and what they didn't realize is they had something they had God, and God had told them, and that was still, that could guide them. If, if, if they had nothing else at this point, that could guide them in this, but, uh, but that is not sufficient in their thinking. You know, not just Moses, but even when they, from my understanding, everybody that's alive at this time has only known a slavery in Egypt. Yes. So they've literally been told since they were born what to do, what not to do. Right. So then they've come to a period where they're they can make their own choice. And they don't have to do yeah, that's right. You said the sad part of it was that Saber didn't have enough righteous backbone to him to stand up and say, I know y'all want to know about Noah. I mean, not Noah, but you know, Moses. Moses just went up into the clouds of God. But y'all done made a covenant that, you know, we can't worship any other idols. Now you can pray to God and Moses is up in the clouds. I ain't going to make it no out. You know, and, and her was also, Moses, when he left, said, now you have Aaron and her with you. If any, you know, any uh, problem comes up, approach them. D now, do you remember that when God first called Moses, you remember that he was very insecure about his ability to do this? And, uh, and, and he didn't want to do it. He wanted God to, to, to provide somebody else. And God did provide him with some help. Who was it? <laughs> Aaron. I wonder if at this moment he's saying, mm. <laughs> maybe, maybe Aaron shouldn't have been the one to speak on, on this occasion. Uh, he didn't use good judgment here. But we're going to see occasions where Moses doesn't, doesn't use uh, good judgment either. But uh, it does seem ridiculous, this, this conversation, if we're understanding what's taking place here correctly, that here is an 83-year-old man saying, well, I just threw the gold in and a calf came out. And, uh, and we'll also see that Abraham, through teaching his son, that two of his sons that were high priests did the same thing that Aaron done by disobeying. Didn't God. have the reverence that they should. Yep. Good point. Anything else? All right, you want to take the next section? Yep. So we just had this exchange, and <clears throat> Moses doesn't even, doesn't even, as we said, doesn't even respond to that. So Moses, we, we mentioned that they rose up to play and, and that. And verse 25, now when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, whoever's on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves to him. So it seems like Moses, even though he has stepped in and pleaded on their behalf with the Lord, he realizes they're out of control and whatever that may entail. Um, it mentions unrestrained, it mentions shame. We've got to get their attention here. 
got to do something to get everybody's attention and get them back on track. And he asked for um, anybody on the Lord's side, you need to come with me. And Levites do. And he said to them in 27, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side, and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp, and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. So Moses takes it upon him, or organizes this, and the Levites go and they... Uh, Door to door, entrance to entrance. Um, it mentions your, every brother, every companion, every, uh, every man to his neighbor. And they start killing killing Israelites that are unrestrained and have rose up to play and are, are, are shameful here and whatever whatever this is. Um, they get to 3,000. I don't know if, if that's the point that they got everybody's attention. You know, and... Um, that everybody, you know, maybe maybe stopped and realized that this was this was going on and this was serious and and, and we've messed up or what. But it mentions that that they, I mean, I don't know how many Levites there were that volunteered for this either. But three thousand Israelites um, are killed here on this occasion. My figure is, you know, with them with the sword. And then them actually killing 3,000 people throughout the, this mass number of Israelites there at the mountain. I mean, I would think that it would send terror through the whole camp. Am I going to be next? The, the Levi's going to come with a sword and kill because that'd be a bloody scene. 3,000 people being killed with a sword just laying everywhere. Yeah. Is this uh, the first time that Israelites turning into Israelites as a nation? I would think so. Yeah, I would think this would be the first time. Right. Yeah, I would think this would be the first time that we would have seen it. Um, you, you know, going back to whatever the unrestrained may have been, uh, a lot of people, probably the most common view that I've seen of this is probably... Uh, sexual misconduct and certainly that was paired with idolatry very frequently and so some have suggested that's what's taking place here you know we'll see this later when they come into the plains of moab at, at baal peor you remember that the moabite women come come down and, and and entice the israelite men to worship their gods and to commit fornication so we see it paired together there maybe that's what's under consideration here Whatever it was was shameful. It was shameful in the sight of the nations, which some would say, well, it must have been really bad if the Canaanites would look at it and say that's shameful. But it also may be that it was shameful in the, in the, in, in the sight of the nations because God's people were to conduct themselves better than this. It's not necessarily that the Canaanites would have not behaved this way, but it's that God's people shouldn't behave this way. And it's shameful in the sight of the nation for those who call themselves uh, the people of God to be conducting them, themselves this way. It's, it's interesting to me that Moses says, who's on the Lord's side? you got to make a choice here. Are you on God's side or not? And the Levites step up and say, we are on God's side. What does that mean to be on God's side? Yep. And what about family? My loyalties to God even above family. And uh, we haven't read this verse yet, I don't think yet, but in verse uh, 29, Moses said, and he's speaking to the, the, the Levites, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, that he may bestow on you a blessing, for every man has opposed his son and his brother. And he uses that word son there to bring it, I think, even a, even a closer relationship. When, when Moses says, who's on the Lord's side? What he's saying is, who is willing to put God first above everything else? 
and the Levites step forward. And we'll see that God, this will come up later. The reason that God uses the Levites the way that he does in his plan, this is part of the reason at least. But that idea of what it means to be on the Lord's side, is Jesus going to say anything about that? What does Jesus say about that that would relate to this? Yeah, whoever, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. When disciples were coming to follow him, he turned around and he said to them, whoever does not hate father and mother in his own life also cannot be my disciple. And so very, very strong language there. And, uh, and, and what I want us to see is all the way through the Bible, there's really no room. There's no room for anything to be even remotely close to being equal with God. So much so that here when Moses says, who's on the Lord's side? That what he's saying is, your loyalty has to supersede all other loyalties, even the most close family relationships, the, the, the greatest loyalty that we have outside of God. It has to supersede it so much so that we would be willing to cut that off. And that's exactly what they were called on to do on this occasion. Tough tough job that they stepped up for on this. And uh, to put their own countrymen, their own family members to death because of their rebellion and sin. And they did so. And, no. No. I, yeah, so what, I, what I'm guessing is taking place here based upon kind of, and we're, we'll kind of see this in the story of uh, the sin at Baal Peor as well, is that you kind of have instigators, you kind of have ringleaders in this, and at least in Baal Peor, that was who was specified. And, what's that? Yeah, and, and I think that's kind of what's happening here as well, that these 3,000 would have been the ones that were keeping this, this uh, shameful behavior, unrestrained behavior. Going. Do you think the Levites were part of it, or the? Yeah. So I I would say the ones that you know the the ones that stepped forward here were certainly not involved in it. But did they kill other Levites that would have been involved in it? And I think that so the way the text reads, I would say there's a very good possibility of that. Yeah, I think it was, yeah. I, I think the ones, and I don't know how, like I think somebody else mentioned this, we don't know how many Levites stepped forward to do this. I don't think that every Levite stepped forward to do this. But the ones that did step forward to do this were Levites and carried this out. And I would guess the way that it's worded that they carried it out even on some other Levites that were involved in this unrestrained behavior. Well, Moses was the leader. Moses, and they done something so bad, he had to let, do something to get their attention. Yes. And 3,000 laying around dead would have got their attention. Yeah, I think that's well, right. Burning the idol and making them grind it up, making them drink didn't get their attention. Right? Maybe if it had, this wouldn't have happened, yeah. but they were out of control and something had to be done. You can imagine. And, and you look at this, and this is terrible. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think would happen if this is not gotten under control? <laughs> I was fixing to say, God's already stated that, you know, get out of my way. Let me just, and Moses pleads with him. And by the way, I wanted to mention one other thing. God relented from what he had planned to do in destroying them. God didn't promise to take them back at his, as his people at this point. I, I, I want you to we'll see that in just a second. Moses realizes, man, this is still a very delicate, precarious situation. And he comes down and he's doing everything that he can to try to save these people. And this was one of those things that he realized was necessary in order to try to save the nation. Yes. That's right. That's a very good point. Very good point. Yes. But um, how long of a time period do you think took place though? As far as like hours or I well, since they started doing this, 
So because if it's actually said in the Supreme Court, they're doing this. Yeah. If there are any part about this, so we can see this and they're talking about it. Like, I imagine it's going to go on for a little while. Yeah. Or yes. Right. So I, I don't know how long from the time that they start worshiping the calf till Moses gets down from the mountain. And, uh, but we do have a time reference in verse 30. It came to pass on the next day that Moses went up. So I, the way that I've read this was not that Moses was down there for weeks or whatever. I get the idea that Moses came down, threw down the tablets, burned the calf, caused that to take place, called the Levites to do this. I, I take it that this is all taking place. This, this idea of stopping this rebellion all took place at the same day. How long that had been taking place before Moses got down there and started this process, I don't know. Like, I don't, I'm sure that God had said it as soon as they decided to do this. He's like, all right, let's just do what they just did. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the party may have been in, in place for a while now. Yeah. Any other thoughts through verse um, 29? At this point, the covenant's broken, right? Yeah, the covenant's broken. There were a lot of, how many, time, how many different faults were there listed where your life was, uh, you know, do this, this person does this, they, they die. This person does this, they die. There were lots of reasons for a person to be killed. Um, that, that made, you know, that weren't this, but, right. uh, you know, you broke it. So they're dealing with the, the consequences here. Yep. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. And again, I, I think about, uh, I suspect if all of us in this room were engaged in something and somebody walked in and put one of us to death because of that activity, I'm pretty sure the rest of it would stop right then. <laughs> and hopefully that's what was taking place here, you know, with each one of these 3,000 that were, were slain, others immediately stopped. Yeah. Yeah. They're, 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 that's right. They're far from being ready for that, aren't they? Yeah. Very good point. All right. So verse uh, 30. It came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. All right. I think what we're seeing here is the, 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 the true heart of a mediator here. You know, he comes down and he feels God's anger towards this. In other words, he can relate to how God feels about this. And we see that come out in the way that he responds and throwing down the tablets of stone and grinding up the calf and causing them to drink it and, and, and killing the instigators of, of this uh, unbridled uh, uh, activity, unrestrained activity. And we see him view things from God's perspective. And then we see him turn around and say, now, let me see if I can approach God and make atonement for you on this and do something to get you back in favor with God. And so that's his intention. He's going back up the mountain now, returning to the Lord. And he comes to the Lord in verse 31, and he says, Oh, these people have sinned a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. What do you, what do you, what do you call that? What's he doing right here? Confession. That's right. He's confessing their sins before God. He's confessing their sins. These people have sinned, a great sin. And he specifies what that sin is. And then look at verse 32. Verse 32 is, is one of the most interesting statements made in the Scripture when you stop and think about it. And I think for a long time, I, I read it and I read through it and didn't Notice this. And somebody pointed it out to me one time, and the more I thought about it, the more impressive it is to me. Verse 32, yet, now speaking to God, yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. Okay, there is a little hyphen right there. 
There's a break in his sentence. And then he picks it back up. And the sentence, the way that it is written, is two different ideas. Those ideas don't flow together continuously because there was an interruption. What happens is Moses gets this far in his sentence and he realizes, oh, I, I, I can't, I don't have anything to wager with God. I don't have anything to offer God. See, it sounds like what he's doing is, God, now, if you'll forgive their sins, here's what I'll do. I'll do this. Well, that, well, that may, well, is that a square deal? Will we come out all right if I do that? And what he realizes is, I have nothing to offer that can equal with you forgiving their sins. And I tend to think that the way, I think the reason I missed that for so long is I read that just like I just read it to you, where I'm not so sure that there's not a really long pause right there as he thinks about it and realizes, oh, there's nothing that me or any other man can offer to atone for sin. And so he just says, if not, blot me out as well. And uh, just, just throw me in with them. The heart of a good mediator. Moses didn't commit this sin. Moses has sinned in other ways at other times, and he realizes that there's nothing that he can offer because he's not a perfect man. No, no sacrifice that he can make that would atone for their sin. But he says, just blot me out as well. Just blot me out as well. I, I Lump me in with them. And uh, what a powerful, powerful statement to make here because the great concern that he has for them, the great realization that he has of the terribleness of sin and how there's nothing that he can offer or anybody else can offer, that it's entirely up to God what he's going to do in this situation. And then his willingness to say, you know, I will, uh, I'll, I'll suffer their fate with this. Any thoughts through verse 32? Yes, he is. He deserved it. He deserved it, no doubt. No doubt. Yes, Joe. Why is he talking about God's plan here? Or is he talking about actual scripture? I'll tell you my thoughts on it. I think this is the first reference that we have to what we normally refer to as the book of life. Those that are in God's favor, those that are, uh, those that are redeemed, those that on the day of judgment will be counted as God's people. innocent. I think this is the first reference. This is going to come up a, a, several times in the Old Testament and in the New Testament as well. This book, this book of remembrance, this book of life. And I think this is probably the first reference. And I think what he's saying here is, God, if, if they're going to be lost, I'll be lost too. I remember hearing someone preach a sermon one time, and they said, you know, I will, I will gladly give my life for my family. I'll gladly give my life for other people. I will not give my soul for other people. And I remember thinking, yeah, that's right. That's right. Because your soul lasts forever. But, you know, I think what Moses is saying here is I would give my soul. And he's not the only one to ever say that. Paul, in the book of Romans, say, I myself wish I could be accursed for them. In other words, if it would help the state of the Jews, I would be lost so that they could be saved. And, uh, and, and so I look at that and I think, I don't know that I have that kind of unselfish attitude that I would give up eternity for someone else. Uh, but that, I think that's what Moses is saying here, and I, I'm pretty sure, I'm almost certain that's what Paul's saying in the book of Romans. Yeah. So, because we know there are people that 
sinning against the Lord, you're still quoting it. Scripture. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's verse 33. You know, the Lord said to Moses, whoever sinned against me, I will blow him out of my book. Is that him telling Moses that's not necessary? You know, Moses offers himself there. But the Lord says, you know, that's not necessary. The, the right. ones that don't obey me will be blotted out. The ones that do yes. will will still be there. Is that right. his is that yeah. his phrase of what he's saying? I think that's right. Yeah. You definitely see Moses now identifying with these people. And you think about what does Jesus do when he pleads for us? He identifies with us before the Father. And, and so when later on when we see the promise that I will raise up a mediator like Moses, a prophet like Moses, a, a mediator, that's, that's what God had in mind for the Messiah, is that he would be one that would, would, would identify with us and plead for us. And... Uh, Maybe God, you know, that that's not ever an option. Even if I was willing to swap places for some, with, with someone who has not obeyed the Lord, that's not an option in the Lord's eyes to do that, right? Even if you were willing to do that. Um, he says that's not how this works. Yep. Um, each man is or is not in my book because of his own decision. So a powerful moment here when, when, when Moses has this conversation with God. So God's reply, verse 33, is, Whoever sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. But God has listened to him in some way because God says, Now therefore, go and lead my people to the place which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day that I visit for punishment, I will visit punishment upon them for their sin. So the Lord plagued the people because of what they did with the calf and which Aaron made. Uh, so in, in what God is saying here, it seems to me that it, it, what he's saying is, um, I'm not going to destroy the people. I am going to take them into the promised land. We'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute, hopefully. Nevertheless, I will, I will punish for this. I will take care of this. I, 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 I'm not letting this go. Now, when did he punish for this? It wasn't immediately. He didn't immediately wipe everybody out. He does talk about a plague in verse 35, and the question is, does this plague happen immediately? I, I tend to think that he plagued them in the sense that what's going to happen for them for the next 40 years? And there's going to be a series of plagues until that whole generation dies out. And uh, I think that we normally think of that generation dying out because of the rebellion at Kadesh Barnea, where they refused to go into the land, and that's absolutely right. But I think that that rebellion started back here, and God is already previewing what's going to happen and say, what's that? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Uh, certainly he's guilty. Uh, he will not go into the promised land. Moses doesn't go into the promised land either, but I don't think Moses was blotted out of God's, God's book. Uh, so I, I don't know how to answer that. You know, the Lord, I don't know where it was at, but the ways he said he would bless them, they were going to be fruitful and they were going to multiply and they were going to, everything was going to work good for them. I can't remember the mm -hmm. word, you know, um, the pregnancies were going to be successful right. and good and uh, their, their flocks were going to do well and uh, those were all things that they had available to them by, by keeping the covenant, but by breaking it, maybe they don't get to experience that. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I I would think so. And he's he, right. Yeah. That, that I think 
I think that makes good sense what you're saying. Tabernacle Court that he actually presented burnt offerings for his sins mm -hmm. in addition that they did also for the people. Right. But that was right there by doing that, that would grow his sins forward. Because he did what was yeah. commanded as you yeah. have sin in your life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think the nation as a whole is going to be plagued. And my understanding is that's what's kind of good. we're going to see in the wandering in the wilderness. Uh, let me make a few brief summaries here of, of this section in 32 and 33. Uh, a very strong lesson. And, and that's what I'm trying to pick out as we go through this, through the, the theme of the Bible is to what are these lessons that God's trying to teach us so that when we get to the New Testament, we understand and we're ready for the Messiah. The first lesson is you can't be God's people if you're breaking His covenant. You just can't. It doesn't work that way. The idea of being God's people is that you're obedient to it. That's what the covenant's based upon. Secondly, you can't pay the debt for sin. Man can't do it. Moses would love to. Moses would give his life to. Moses would give his soul to. But he can't. No man can do that. It's going to take something besides man to pay the debt for sin. And sin prevents God from being with us. And uh, we'll see that really kind of more in this next section here as we get into that, but uh, hold that thought in mind. That last step is interesting because that would normally work the other way. Sin prevents us from being with God. That's because here it's the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that the way they sort of hear it? People say, tell us what we want to hear. And they offer that as worship. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. These things were written for our admonition because there are examples. Same thing. All right, you want to pick up verse 1? And the Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, from the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, Your descendants I will give it. And I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not uh, go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way. For you are a stiff-necked people, stubborn. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned. And no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I come up into your midst. In one moment and consume you now, now therefore take off your ornaments that I may know uh, that I may know what to do to you so the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb so what do you think it means by the way they're dread like their um, clothes of mourning compared to happy uh, celebratory clothes um, is what it's what it's referring to. This was a this was a sign that things were not good. Um, the Lord uh, the Lord will be with them, but He says for now for now I'm not I'm not going with you. If I if uh, you know I, you're stiff necked, and if I if I have anything to do with you right now, um, I will consume you on the way for your stiff neck. Um, so the people mourn. So, so their attention has been got. They they hear this bad news. People are not happy. People are not celebrating. They uh, they don't have on their ornaments that that are mentioned there. Their jewelry. I have a footnote for. It. So. Yeah, I think that that's right. You know, this is one of the places throughout Scripture, and this is something that we know. I mean, I think every culture knows this. Uh, we talk about appropriate dress. Well, what does that mean? Appropriate for what? Well, sim simply by saying appropriate dress, we recognize that there are certain occasions that demand a different, a, a, a different way of conducting ourselves. And our dress is not just for covering. It is also a reflection of something. It also says something. 
Uh, that's why I get so frustrated when here's a person and and they do everything that they can to to draw attention to themselves by the way that they dress and 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 everything. And then they're like, "Well, what are you looking at? Why are you why are you judging me?" It's like. This didn't happen by accident. You were purposely trying to send a message. I read that message. That's the message you were trying to send. That, that's not difficult to understand. We, we convey something by the way that we dress. And, uh, and, and here was an occasion. What should they be conveying right now? Morning. Humility. Humility. Mourning. Uh, you know, sackcloth and ashes is, is the dress that normally accompany what they need to be doing right now. Not decking yourself out with your, your finest Egyptian jewelry. And so I think that that's all that's really being said here. It's, it's not so much about the jewelry. It's about what, what needs to be happening here is there needs to be a humbleness of spirit. There needs to be a broken and contrite heart right now. And that should be reflected in the way that we, we dress and, and, and so forth. Or it should be for them at this point. So I think that that's, uh, that's what's, what, what's under consideration in that. Uh, God makes the point here. This is, this, this is one of the saddest moments, and, and I want you to think about this. Where are they going? What's, what's the grand hope that they have here? The promised land. That is the grand hope that they have. Do you know what the grand hope that God has is? That he, they'll be his people, that he can dwell with them. Now, here's what I want you to see. God says, all right, go ahead and go. I'll send my angel. He'll drive out the Canaanites. And look at verse 3. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst. I can't. You're wicked. I would consume you. We can't dwell together. You're not holy as I am holy. But we still get to go to the land flowing with milk and honey. This is great. No, it's not. Uh, um, if you could go to heaven and you could enter through that big pearl gate and walk on that street of gold and you could have that mansion that's silver lined, that gold one that's silver lined or silver gold lined, whichever way it goes. But God's not there. Is that a good deal? It is not a good deal. If you can go to the land flowing with milk and honey, but God is not there, it's not a good deal. And, and I'll tell you, I don't think that the description of heaven with the gold streets and the, and the gate of pearl, I believe what that's a description of is where God is. That's what makes it so beautiful and glorious and splendid and valuable. If God wasn't there, then it wouldn't be described that way. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be. That's the passage that the King James refers to as a mansion. I go to prepare a mansion for you. What makes it a mansion? Where I am, there you may be also. The land of Canaan flowing with milk and honey loses all of its splendor when God says, but I can't be with you. I can't go with you. The value of being God's people is not the material blessings. The value of being God's people is being part of his family. And anytime we lose that, then we've lost sight of what it's really all about. This is one of those moments where God says, fine, I'll give you the land of Canaan. But that, what's that? That's nothing. Lots of people can occupy the land of Canaan, but who could be a great nation and have Jehovah as their God? An obedient nation. And that's not what they were at this point. Yeah, they're sad about it, which is... Because you, like, they were super shallow. They were like, okay, great, we get the land. Right. But they do seem to present that this is disastrous to us. Yes. Yeah, you're right. That is in encouraging that at least they realize, oh, wow, well, that's not, that's not all that great. Any other f thoughts through verse 6? God's also tempted this two reasons. One, that he ain't going up with them because they're wicked. But he's going to keep his promise that he told Abraham that he would get that land. That's a good point. Yeah. So he's telling them, 
I'm still honored by promise with your father Abraham that I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. But since you actually broke the laws that y'all agreed to be, me be your God and you be my people, I'm not going to. Yep. It's almost like that's, you know, God's mad enough to kill him back with the calf. And Moses stepped in, but it's almost like God said, I'm still mad enough to kill you. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's in right. In a moment, I can step mm -hmm. in and save you right now. It's so, still serious. Yeah. It's still serious. All right. Thank you all for your good attention. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.